Um, and I hope that you agree with, with uh, recording the session. So we create an artifact that can be shared, and in particular can be shared far across the center. So um, by no means you want to create a lot of redundancy. We want to want to be also creating artifacts that matter to the broader QT community. And, and a lot of conversations that we have um, in the next hour or so, of course, on the one side focus to our discipline, um, but of course also of relevance to many stakeholders. Um, I also do apologize because I've got the audience on the right, the screen in front and the camera on the left. So I'm not always sure where to look at here best. Um, so this is very much here um, uh, a session um, in, in which we of course do what we're supposed to do best, engaging with the real world. We, we are, as you know, a university for the real world and in the ARC linkage scheme, like now other scheme um, should be one that is close to our heart. Um, ironically, um, which is on the one side great, uh, when it comes to future fellows, even ASC laureates, we, we did exceptionally well. Um, but when it came to ASC linkages, I think we still can do a bit, bit better than, than what we're supposed to do as a university uh, that, like no other university, aims to be a university for the real world. And how we get to this real world engagement uh, even better and, and, and capitalize on, on what we can do hopefully better than anybody else will be the focus here. And I'm grateful in particular for the opening session that, that Lisa and, and Saga, you indeed very fast. Um, can join us this morning. Uh, I'm grateful to, to Gemma and Isa for organizing this, and of course the whole team, um, Holly, uh, but everybody else involved from OIS and uh, OIE, Mr. Gageman, who have made this um, session here this morning possible. Um, like always, uh, it's very, very important for us that we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on, on which we meet, um, and, and speaking on, on where we are right now here at QT Gardens Point, uh, we acknowledge the Turrbal and Yogara as the First Nations owners of their lands where QT, as you all know, stands. And we will pay respect to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits. Uh, we recognize that these lands have also been places of teaching, research, and learning, and will continue to be so. And of course, QT acknowledges the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QT community. Again, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is about uh, an ARC linkage. Um, well, there's a lot of public knowledge. We, we want to make this really like a, a discussion intensive conversation so that we all um, get, get closer to, to what can be done. Uh, ARC linkage is different too, as you know, uh, other grants, because on the one side, it's, it's a larger scale opportunity. Um, it's even more attractive financially often than an ARC discovery because in addition to the ARC, you get funding from the industry as well. Um, but it's also this puzzle piece, industry engagement, that is so different than you sitting at your desk, writing down your most brilliant, um, most theoretical ideas in isolation. It's the art of engaging with the industry partner well. Um, statistically, getting an IRC linkage is easier um, than, for example, get an IRC discovery. Um, finally, I'm very mindful that a number of the, the people in the audience today are uh, postdoctoral um, researchers. So, so for a postdoctoral uh, researcher, in addition to an ARC DECRA, an ARC linkage is, in, is interesting um, because there's an opportunity to literally craft your own position as part of an ARC linkage. Um, so you could be a, a named postdoctoral fellow, and if your credentials stand up, um, that is one more tick towards a, a highly successful linkage. Um, we we want to elaborate a bit on, on how we get there and what makes up a successful a linkage. So I might just straight hand over um, to Lisa and then to Saga to share some of their ideas. Um, we, we want to make this short and sharp as I highlighted to have a lot of time for conversations. Uh, and in particular, uh, would love to learn from, from two individuals who have been tremendously successful with ARC linkages and other industry type of engagements. And, and maybe if I can ask you both, uh, Lisa and Saga, uh, now of course you, you're on a global scale much respected, but if you could also reflect on, on your very first ARC linkage engagement, on your very first industry engagement, um, what are the one or two elements where you feel there might not be public knowledge, but they might be relevant to share? Um, I will then continue with my own observations in terms of um, uh, what made up uh, success for us. Uh, but before I do so, uh, maybe if you don't mind, Lisa, I would love to start with you. And, and Lisa, as you are now, is, is our um, head of school of the School of Accountancy. We're totally delighted to have you here 
it's always wonderful to have leaders who are incredibly research active as well. Um, so maybe Lisa, if you don't mind sharing a bit of, of your insight and your recommendations to an audience that goes literally from, from a junior postdoc to a well-established professor, what constitutes the value and how do I get to an ASC linkage? Thank you so much. No, thank you, Michael. Um, look, I apologize for not being in the room with everyone there. I'm, I'm glad most people are online. I, I didn't like the thought of having to, um, I struggled with the mask. I'll be really honest with you, talking with the mask. And I thought it was better if I just zoomed in. Um, Michael, look, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify just one little thing. Um, I actually am on the ARC College of Experts. Um, I'm in my second year, one more year to go. I'm considering putting my hand up for another round simply because I think it's so useful. And uh, I like to be a representative of the business area, social sciences, um, and I, I think I've added some value. You know, I've assessed a number of linkage rounds. I will admit to you, so everyone knows, I am not a successful ARC linkage uh, winner. So I, I don't know whether, Michael, whether you want to discuss, go first or Saga would like to, but no, I'm very happy to give no, my no, views no, as an no, assessor. No, I, I treat you as a very successful individual. <laughs> I wish I was. You do industry engagement as well. So, but, but if you sit on the other side and look at an ARC linkage, um, I think in the book, Malcolm Gladwell talk about thin slicing, one of the few elements that matter. What are the few elements that matter when it comes to a successful ARC linkage from your view? Uh, from my view in assessing them, um, I'd, I'd like to think that maybe I am a successful researcher, Michael, which is how I was successful in um, getting on the ARC college. But uh, being in accounting, it's always challenging to be able to uh, obtain a sufficient funding to get to that level. But so um, what I do know is I do know industry engagement. I've been successful in undertaking, getting uh, accessing grants, et cetera, from outside. As Michael commented in the beginning, um, the linkage is, has a lesser theoretical focus and, and much more an industry engagement. Some of the most challenging things uh, I found in actually reading the ARC linkage applications, and it's very similar to what I talk about when I talk about uh, discoveries or DECRAs uh, or the Future Fellowship. It really is all about the narrative. Um, quite often um, applicants have uh, the, the right um, uh, mix there, uh, but the, the narrative isn't as, as strong or as um, a forthright and simple as what it could be. Um, so obviously, yes, you have to, the challenge is to, I've seen some very complex ARC linkages where there are, you know, 15, 20 partners involved in different stages of the project. So an ARC linkage obviously is something that you need to start thinking of very early. Uh, it is something that you can't do in the last three months or you know, six months, it, it is very challenging to do that. Um, so it's about building the relationship with the with the partners, obviously very important in your area of expertise. Um, and quite often it's not always just one partner, quite often it's a package of partners that will contribute to different stages. Um, and so the, the building of the linkages with the, the industry partners are very important. Obviously, uh, very, having a very clear plan and project. And so someone who's reading it, who may not even be an expert in your field, that's the other thing to remember, is that on the ARC College of Expert, there isn't necessarily always someone who is an expert in the area of your application that's going to read it, or going to be, sorry, a carriage one or carriage two, we call it, or co-carriage. Um, and the carriage one um, is such a, if I'm carriage one of, a, of, of an ARC linkage or any, any grant, I'm the one who actually defends that. I'm the one who argues that this is a valuable project that we need to support um, based on our, my ranking and the ranking of the assessors and the co-carriage. Um, so it needs to quite often be uh, in, in simple language that clearly articulates the outcomes to industry. So yes, there needs to be some, needs to be research outcomes within there because the money is coming from the ARC. But it is also very, very, very focused on solving a problem in the real world. So it, the important thing is, and I always say this to everyone, it's the narrative, it's the story. It's very clearly articulating exactly what the outcomes will be. Um, one, that's one of the probably the biggest problems that I've, I've come across when, when reading the linkage grants, because I can assume that there's this and this will come out of it. And yes, it has this impact, et cetera. But if it's not clearly articulated, it, it's very difficult for me to be able to actually defend that on the panel uh, amongst a number of competing 
project ideas. And Michael is correct. Linkage rates of success are much higher, much easier. I'd say easier is probably not the right word, Michael, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it easy in inverted commas in comparison to uh, a discovery or any of the, some of the other, um, some of the other um, grant types. Now, the, one of the reasons for that is because, um, as you know, uh, industry uh, funding should be, must be 50% or, or more of, of the total package. So ARC uh, amount that goes in is less, therefore we can actually fund more. Um, so it's, it, I cannot, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, Michael, because I know you want to keep this short and sharp, but my main message to everyone, and it always is, is, is the narrative. Try to make it simple to so someone when I say simple, I don't do, it doesn't need to be dumbed down. That's not what I'm saying at all. But the, the actual outcomes and the impact and the, and the program uh, needs to be as straightforward as you can make it so that someone who may not be a specialist in your field, who may likely be assessing it, can actually follow it and understand it and then argue on your behalf. Because that's the, that's the role of the carriage on is to argue on the behalf of the applications that, we're, um, that we accept, that we're, we go carriage one on. So it's always about the narrative. And I, I, look, I'm happy to answer questions and I'm happy to jump in from an assessor's point of view with anything that goes on, Michael, but I don't want to take too much time because I know that we've got only an hour. Um, but I wanted to sort of, I suppose, just reiterate to you all, it is the narrative, it is the story you tell. Make it clear, make it concise um, and ensure that the, it's very clearly stated the, the, the problem that you're solving, the industry uh, solutions that you're going to be providing um, and that's incredibly important. Um, does that, is that, is that a good way to start, Michael? It's a perfect start, Lisa. Um, before I know to Saga, very quick question. You talked about the, the importance of a real world problem. Yeah. How do you turn a real world problem into a scientific problem? How do you, how do you craft a narrative uh, that highlights, it's not just a, a big step for the industry partner, but a, but a big step for humankind? Uh, that's not always an easy thing to do, Michael, depending on the area that you're, you're particularly looking at. Um, I think, for example, it is perhaps um, most easier in some of our uh, practical disciplines or our applied disciplines, uh, such as business. Um, and I say business, when I say business, I say quite broader. I'm not just talking about talking business broader. Um, so solving, a, a, so identifying a problem with your partner, what is it they want solved? And then looking at that, it doesn't have to be the entire problem that become a research uh, uh, pro program or research output. It could be slices of that. So they might have a broader problem that you go, know, okay, well, I can solve their problem. Now it might be a problem to, um, for example, um, how to solve an IT issue they have or a huge issue or a problem with identifying, uh, I'm coming from my own perspective here, identifying their, their, their profitable customers and how to develop a program to actually manage that. So by doing that, you can slice little slices, perhaps of uh, scientific output and scientific research, but all in all, continually focusing on solving the problem for the industry partner or partners that you have. So you don't necessarily look at it the broader view, it's more of a smaller view, uh, Michael. So it's very difficult for me to, and I can't give you examples from the linkage grants that I have assessed, obviously, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, um, because I'm sure, I don't know, lightning will strike me and the ARC gods will come and get mad at me, Michael. Mm -hmm. And it's only Monday, I can't deal with that now. Um, right. So it is, about, it is about looking the broader, solving the problem, and then identifying particular, it may not be, the, as I said, the whole problem that becomes a you know, research app and a research focus. It could be smaller slices. That's the important thing to actually focus on. Thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate this advice. Um, Lisa, if you just if stay with us for the Q&A. I will. I'm, I'm going to stay the entire time, Michael. You've got me the uh, full hour. I'm right here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, uh, My pleasure. Uh, from um, one room with beautiful background pictures to the next one, uh, Saga, it's wonderful to have you here. And as you all know, Saga is one of QT's uh, rock stars, um, globally known. And, and, and now his area of research, being the director of the Center for Agriculture and Biochemistry, sounds quite different to, to what we study. Uh, I think there's so many similarities and, and learning from someone who, uh, as an individual and as a centre director, is doing industry engagement far beyond the ARC linkage so brilliantly. Uh, we really, really uh, value, Saga, that you spent some of your valuable time this morning with us. Uh, this is a big question. We give you a very small um, window of time to elaborate on this. Uh, but same question to you, Saga. 
Uh, uh, do you believe uh, makes up a successful ARC linkage? Uh, what what are you looking for uh, as an author of an application or as an advisor, as a mentor to those who try to be successful with an ARC linkage? Over to you, Saga, please. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, can I be heard clearly across? Yes, Michael. Yes, and uh, and thanks, Lisa, for providing us an outstanding foundation on which I'm going to build on in terms of your presentation. Uh, for starters, uh, at the Center for Agriculture and the Bioeconomy, uh, we have around 104 staff. I would say comfortably uh, about 55 to 60 percent are early and mid-career team members. Uh, extremely ambitious, extremely keen uh, to progress uh, their research ideas, et cetera. And, uh, and as you would imagine, uh, as a center last year that brought in a research income and consultancy income of about 17 million, safely about 60 to 70% of our income comes from industry partnerships. So I've had the opportunity of mentoring uh, a number of individuals with successful ARC linkage uh, grantees uh, I should also declare that I have never applied for an ARC linkage myself, but it's only because I've got all my most of my industry funding uh, through other types of partnerships, which is really where I would like to lay the foundation. on. So coming fresh out of a Fulbright scholarship and having returned to the University of Cape Town in South Africa, we have a similar scheme to the ARC linkage. And, uh, and I started to think about how is it that having been out of the country as a young postdoc, uh, leading into an academic world, uh, what is it that I need to do to be able to get the successful industry engagement uh, and, and get grants across the line? And I'm sure many of you are in the same position as well. What I immediately did was I looked at the environment I was in, the ecosystem, and without a shadow of doubt, there were individuals that were already successfully engaging with industries. And uh, my area of interest is mainly about making crops more resilient and nutritious. And it just so happened one of the strengths of the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology at the University of Cape Town did a lot of work on disease resistance in maize. And uh, so we used to travel as groups, as a research team to some industry forums, conferences, where we, there was a group of individuals that consistently from industry turned up. And I, use this as an opportunity to be introduced to some of the key industry partners in the sector and started to bounce off and share the ideas that I had around enhancing the resilience as well as the nutritional profile of these, uh, particularly maize itself. And, uh, and these started off as, well, the industry partner said, I'll be happy to put $50,000 on the table for us to just explore this partnership because one has to appreciate that these uh, industry engagements don't take place overnight. It requires you seeding, building those relationships on which you could then build bigger things. And uh, when I was able to deliver very effectively a $50,000 project, when I went up to them to say, well, there's a $300,000 project that I'd like you to invest in, it became almost a no-brainer that they were not just investing in the project, but there was in, they were investing in me and my team. So I think you've got to look at that as building on partnerships initially based on successful partnerships that are already in place. So now moving that year into the Center for Agriculture and the Bioeconomy, that's exactly our modus operandi. And uh, so far, our center has had, uh, we have, in fact, at, at present, we have three successful ARC linkages. But if you take a look at many of the other funding vehicles that we have been utilizing, it actually takes those industry partnerships to levels that so far hasn't warrant us, warranted us to actually turn to the ARC. But we are currently working on a number of applications that are in the pipeline that are highly likely to get across the line in the next couple of rounds. So coming to the center, what we do is that because we do a fair bit of work on what we refer to as the area around renewable energy, food and nutritional security, and also turning waste into value, we target specific conferences where we know there's gonna be a strong presence of industry partners. And we take along with us early and mid-career team members, make these introductions and allow them to essentially go ahead and build these interactions. I talked to our most recent uh, successful ARC linkage uh, applicant and early and mid-career team member within our center, uh, Associate Professor Jan Zhang. And he indicated to me that 
the first introduction that he was made that uh, was made to the industry partner that eventually got this across the line was in 2016. And this in the last round, he was uh, successful in getting the uh, ARC linkage across the line. And it took that amount of years to actually build a partnership. Uh, they seeded smaller projects that ultimately led to this major application. So for me, it's the journey is quite critical. But we should also be looking at not where the puck is, but where is it going to land, which means that what are the most innovative technologies that allows us to be able to deliver to this industry partner that we maintain will actually keep them sufficiently engaged. Uh, I'm currently uh, working on a major initiative around nutrigenomics, which is how you take these crops and actually start to deliver health benefits bringing together a range of disciplines and proposing to industry some opportunities that I would say very few in the world have actually started to think about because of the ability to be able to build on these strengths. And I have already started to bring industry partners along this journey, and we will be looking at submitting an ARC linkage in the next couple of rounds, largely around this area. And but this journey here is not just about myself. It's really about the team that's actually complementing all the skills that will allow us to deliver on this. So if there are some key messages that I would like to convey to you, it is start small, build those industry partnerships uh, on solid ground. I would quite comfortably say that about 70 to 80% of all the industry partners that we are engaging with at our center have actually been with us for the last 10 to 15 years. And it's largely because of the fact that they have actually not just seen individuals, research teams, centers, and QUT as an organization that's delivering those outcomes, but it also gives us a chance to work within a community. I will stop there and be happy to take some questions and, uh, on any aspect. Over to you, Michael. Sorry, you are muted. Um, thanks, Saga. I just said um, thank you so much for your contributions here. Um, your authentic assessment, um, and I, I like what you said that, that a lot of these industry partners are long-lasting partners. Maybe also a quick question to you: If I'm a junior partner, I, I typically don't have a strong industry network. How do you broker, let's say, the, the curious, as you highlight, highly ambitious individual who sits on a compelling research question with with your established industry network? How does this brokerage work in detail? So we, as I indicated, we could target, if there's a specific industry partner that we believe that we could essentially, we are keen to develop a strategic partnership. It may just involve getting into a car, driving to the operation and engaging with them directly. And we have done this in the past. Uh, we were very keen to start to establish a relationship with the cotton industry. And we literally you know, funded a couple of researchers traveling down to Narrabri, the mere fact that we made the effort to get to where the industry partner is located immediately gave us the attention of the industry partner. And to cut a long story short, uh, the uh, cotton industry is one of our major funding uh, agencies at the center. I did the same with a company called Deacon Seeds located in Dalby. And, uh, and we have developed two major projects with them. And it was largely sitting down for a morning, visiting, looking at the operations, and then engaging. And this, in this particular case, took us about six months before we had developed those project ideas. So I think uh, it's important uh, to make the effort to get out of our comfort zones, in spite of you know, COVID-19 restrictions, et cetera, to connect with industry partners and to go out there and not just with preconceived ideas, but be prepared to also shape it to address what the industry wants to see addressed as well. Thank you so much, Sagan. I think it's a good point. The question is, uh, do, we, do we give birth to the question on campus and then try to find someone who wants to partner with us? Or are we, are we good on listening skills and can convert a research question, uh, sorry, a real world problem into a research question and, and, and find that sort of marriage? So the question is, is it push or pull? And I'm not sure what, what your experience are, Saga, to what is a sort of percentage where it's pull versus push, whether it's uh, research led versus industry led? I think it's a balance of both. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have bold, innovative ideas, but at the end of the day, uh, you want to also have be a good listener to be able to pick up and listen to the ideas and hopefully find the middle ground. Uh, 
when I looked at this opportunity around nutrigenomics, you know, I mean, I had grand plans of working on potatoes, working on chickpea, mung bean, etc. But the industry partner was laser focused on chickpea because it's probably one of the most prolific crops that uh, we could potentially build on. And, uh, and therefore, we started to shape those ideas into a single crop. And that's what got us across the line, actually, you know. Thanks so much, Saga. So um, we have a little time for q and I'm, I'm happy to also add myself to the panel discussion. So like Lisa, I've been on uh, the ASC College of Experts. I, I put a few ASC linkages in, and I had a number of them, uh, three of them with the same industry partner, SAP. And, and I remember when I arrived here, not knowing anyone at, at QUT, I needed money. I needed to scale up. And, and looking at the sheer probability, it was obvious that the ARC linkage was at least statistically the easiest to get that sort of money. Uh, then, then a bit like what Saga described, I, I tried to listen carefully, tried to build up a, a quick industry network, uh, but it was a sort of appetite, the, the hunger to scale up my research. And, and once I found a partner, uh, then, then we kind of quickly converted this into a problem that mattered to the partner, but also it was generic enough to be applicable across the broader spectrum. Um, we, uh, again, as a center director, do a, a couple of things to support an ARC linkage. One is what we call the reverse pitch. Uh, so urban utilities came a few weeks ago and, and it was a nice exercise. So we had to actually meet them three times so they articulated the real world problem. Um, and we took time to translate their real world problem into a research problem. And that's something that doesn't always come easy for the industry partner because while they can see the immediate problem, uh, it's sometimes difficult for them to appreciate what makes up a big scientific problem that requires three years of intellectual attention. Uh, so this also, we've spent a lot of time with our industry partner to what I call scientify, convert a real problem into a scientific problem. Um, that gives us some time now, and I really like to, like to invite everyone here um, to ask some questions so, so we can really address whatever matters to you most. So with this, I'd like to open up the floor for a bit of a Q&A. And when you ask the question, please, of course, unmute and share your video. Is there anyone? Um, if, if this is not the case, maybe maybe question to you, uh, Lisa and, and, and Sagar. What, what do you think are the biggest roadblocks to ARC linkages? So, so why is it that we get more discoveries then we get linkages when the linkage success rate is nearly twice as high as a discovery. Uh, and maybe if I can ask you first, Lisa, and then Saga. Um, well, Michael, first off, I'd say that it is a it is a um, it's a matter of the number of linkages that go in um, based on that's the percentage of success rate. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I think that um, the movement towards building industry uh, relationships and partnerships and solving their problem is, I don't want to say it's a new idea, it's not, but for many researchers just coming out from a postdoc or you know early career researchers, their focus is really just upon publications and the research focus. So it takes a little bit of a while, as you, as Saga's very clearly articulated, to actually build those relationships and be able to list, learn to listen and to be able to solve the industry problems. Um, so I think sometimes linkages do go in, I'll be really honest, that are not quite at the point where they could be funded um, because you, you need to show that there's a track record um, as well. Um, and quite often just pulling, you know, uh, 10, 10 groups in and putting a linkage in when you've got no experience with those partners, that's always a little bit of a, and I've got another competing application, for example, where there's smaller projects that have gone on, it's been successful, it's a strong partnership, that I'd be more likely to be able to defend easier than someone that's one that's just new. Um, so linkages do take, I think, a, a, a lot longer to actually get into the game in comparison to some of the other, um, from my perspective anyway, from assessing them, uh, from some of the other uh, grants, as well as managing schools and, and, and managing staff who are, are putting them through. It does take longer, Michael. So I think that's probably why there's a, a lower success rate and also it does depend upon the percentage of sex rate depends upon the number of uh, applications that a university actually uh, puts in as well obviously it's driven by that factor yeah, yeah. So, uh, talking about national average um saga same question to you if i'm a, I'm a junior um, researcher 
a deck that seems to be uh, more, more more challenging than than a linkage. So if if we as a center could provide industry connections, it, it seems like a marriage made in heaven. Uh, but but why do we not see a high uptake of linkages uh, in the submission stage and then also in the successful stages at QET? Yep. Uh, well, Michael, I mean, just using uh, our center as an example, there are a range of other opportunities to be able to engage with industry. For example, we have been quite successful in the CRCs. Uh, for starters, you know, QUT goes into these arrangements with the corporate research centers. It's a 10 year horizon. So when you introduce an industry partner, you more than likely have that window to be able to engage with. So the Fight Food Race CRC, Future Food System CRC, Food Agility, I've been, you know, where QUT as an organization have put in 200 to $250,000 a year for a 10 year period. So we found that you know, there was a tendency to actually introduce the industry partners to that. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, there are also those CRCPs, you know, the projects, the shorter CRCs or the CRC for developing Northern Australia. Then you have your RDCs, your research development corporations, like Grains Research Development Corporation, Cotton Research Development Corporation, Horticulture Innovation. They themselves have these industry engagement programs where they actually match dollar for dollar. So that has been also, we have had a quite a bit of success there. But there are other cases where, like I have a very strong partnership with one of the world's leading gene editing companies based out of North Carolina. And I said, I think this is a perfect marriage in heaven here to go in for an ARC linkage. And as Lisa said, it was the time that became a factor. They said, by the time this goes in, gets assessed and approved, we want to get this result out sooner than that. So they funded the whole program themselves, you know, and literally put in about a million dollars into it. So you have those competing commitments. That is why I emphasize that when you are in these longer term relationships, there will be some really strategic fit because we've got the discipline strength, we've got the innovation and we've got the industry partner for the longer haul. Then I think putting in ARC linkages would probably be very befitting and it's managing the risk associated with not getting the industry partner to lose interest. The other key success factor from our end, Michael, is between the time you submit your, you, you hit the send button uh, on submission of the uh, application is to actually get some activity started. Uh, the uh, faculty of the science and engineering faculty, historically now faculty of engineering and faculty of science have what is called a kickstart program where they match dollar for dollar up to $30,000 to be matched by industry to get some of the work started. So you keep the industry partner engaged. I think that has been, a, for me, you know, quite a deal breaker because you actually have got that industry partner uh, seeing some fruits of that engagement rather than waiting for a six month period. Very good point, Saga. I mean, we often talk about a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is I only have industry dollars. Plan B, at some point, we might get linkages. Uh, but we start running with plan A anyway, and if we're lucky, it scales up. Um, Sarah, I, I'd like to hand over to you for your question. So could you please unmute yourself and feel free to share your video as well if you like. Certainly, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, hopefully coming through now. There we go. Um, so I was curious um, to ask our speakers um, if they could maybe um tell us a little bit more about um what might be involved in the conversations that you would have with um, an industry partner um to sort of help them understand um why a three-year focused research program might be required to address a slice of their issue like i guess i'm not always clear on how it is that you know whether we're educating clients whether we're you know partners whether we are helping them understand these things like as part of this um, process, particularly where it might be involved a partner that hasn't been involved in an industry in a partnership with a university before. I'd be very interested to hear some thoughts around that. Great question, Sarah. So again, maybe maybe Lisa, if you want to start, followed by Saga. Uh, look, I'm, I'm not going to say much here, Sarah. Great question. I think I'm going to throw to Saga as he's got that experience. Um, for me, um, when I'm looking at uh, some of the most successful, the, the, the successful linkage grants. So I actually think that they're doing everything. I think they're educating. I think they're doing the whole lot. I don't think it's a, 
or one focus at all. But I'm going to pass to Saiga because I think that his comments are probably going to be more, uh, um, uh, uh, much more important and better than what mine are. Saiga, I'll pass to you, sir. Yep, I think, uh, Sarah, that, that's a very pointed and pertinent question, you know, to, to be asking, because when you meet an industry partner for the first time, you are also quite eager to leave a good impression. At the same time, you want to ensure that they have clarity on what you're actually going to be delivering. And in most cases, the industry partner wants all of this done in three to six months, you know, and they expect that there will be, you know, undivided attention given to what they would like to see done. So we always firstly put into pit in the perspective QUT as an organization, you know, uh, what we are trying to achieve. And I uh, used the opportunity to talk about the university for the real world on the longstanding engagement. Then I hone in onto our center's activities and talk about the track record that we have, particularly in developing capacity and capability for mid to longer term, you know, so that's, and I never have these conversations with industry partners on my own. I always take a team of early and mid career folks along this journey so that they can actually see and not hear everything from me, but also hear from the researchers, what is it that's gonna entail? Because at the end of the day, what is the most significant cost associated with this project? It's the salary of staff. And, uh, and they need to be aware that when you are supporting team members, we can't actually just, uh, employ someone for six months to do something that's actually going to take a year. And often it starts off with a whiteboarding exercise, you know, we, uh, and it could be on paper on literally a whiteboard where we talk about, you know, I mean, if this is really going to be achieved. So what are the steps that are leading to that? And let's put some guesstimate timelines. And on the basis of that, we talk about, you know, budgets are always important conversation to have. And again, it's not detailed budgets, but what does it cost to support an early career researcher, a mid-career researcher who is actually working full-time for this? So suddenly they realize that this is not a $50,000 type commitment, but it could be up to about 150 or even 200. And uh, I also put it into context, what you know, uh, the other benefits associated, if you are investing in R&D, there's a national, a federal R&D tax incentive where technically you should be able to get back 43.5 cents for every dollar you put in. So you actually have to navigate through the system. And over and above that, what is it that QUT is contributing in kind? We often fail to appreciate the cost that's associated with just turning the lights on, all the support system. The other uh, elephant in the room is intellectual property. You know, Out of this year, there needs, there should not be any mixed messages. Ideally, if it's unclear to you, do get some advice before you go into this conversation. What are the options? Bring those individuals if you feel you're not adequately equipped to be able to have the discussion. That at the end of the day, QUT wants to see this project develop to a point where it's a benefit to the industry partner. Uh, at the same time, we are investing resources. We would like to see some benefit coming back to the university, but you are investing in an individual you know, or a team that actually leading to that. So I'm not too sure if there's anything in addition, as you could see, this is something that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm more than happy to, to, to take any further questions on something specific. Uh, and and it's, it's really, once you start that conversation, you've got to take the responsibility to be able to respond and respond in a very timely manner. Because what often what we would do is put a confidentiality agreement in place. While it might seem like just a formality, it really demonstrates our seriousness about wanting to work with the partner and give them enough confidence that we are actually you know, going to treat the information that they are sharing confidentially. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question, Sarah. And, and this was wonderful advice, um, Saga and also Lisa. Much appreciate this. Um, we had a moment in time in our workshop where we thought we hand over to our eyes and how I unless there's any other immediate burning question um, if this is not the case it's, it's a very rare uh, opportunity for us to, to talk not just only to, to a current member of the college of experts but also to our probably uh, one of our leading industry engaging uh, researchers saga and lisa so from the bottom of our heart and from all of us we, we very very much appreciate your time 
time that you spend this morning. Uh, we totally understand if you now um, dedicate your attention to, to other matters. Uh, but again, thank you so much to both of you. Um, we really deeply, deeply appreciate your time and advice. Take care. Thank you very much, Michael, for the opportunity. And thank you. And folks are welcome to reach out to me if you need some specific advice. We appreciate this, Saga. Thank you so much. Um, the same for you, Gita. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michael. I'm probably going to stay around and listen in, if that's okay with you, just in case I might get educated as well. <laughs> We're delighted to have you here. Um, I might hand over. Do you want to share the, the, the second part of our session here? So I'm hand Emily, okay. Um, so do you want to say a few words or Emily first? I might have a hand up. Okay, then, then I'll let Emily. Maybe. Um, so what we do now is we, we go from, from a conversation with our um, academics to, to a conversation with those professional services that matter most when it comes to an ARC linkage. Uh, so we've got first Emily and then Holly. Uh, Emily from, of course, the Office of Research Services uh, and then Holly, of course, from Industry Engagement Team. Um, I'll leave it up to you how, how you, Emily and Holly want to want to organize this. Uh, but I understand I might hand over to, to Emily first. Sure, thanks, Michael. Um, so firstly, uh, are you going to share my slides or shall I share them? I know they were sent to you. Yeah, I think we can share them. Oh, is she? Because Jane was meant to do it. Okay. Okay. So you want to share yours? Unless you have access Yep, I can share mine. Yep. Probably. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you hear them? Pardon? Actually, that. Um, we want to share the slides. It's easier. Oh, so don't we? But I thought we had her slides. No, no, I don't know. Because I thought Janet, she said she's going to share her own slides. So, sorry, um, so Emily, I made your co-host, so this should work now. Sorry. Ah, okay, thank you. Sorry about the delay. That's okay. So I'm just trying to find. You wanna, if you can't, Emily, then we can share from our Yeah, time. sorry, it's not picking up my um, PowerPoint no. for some Anissa, can you do it? unknown reason. <laughs> okay, Anissa has got your slides as well. We'll do this for you. Sure. And then let's tell Anissa when you want them. Are you okay? I thought I, I hand over to Holly first. Oh, I can't. I, I for some reason it won't let me share a PowerPoint. I'm not entirely sure why. All right. Um, if it's too tricky, I might hand over to. At least uh, uh, Holly's first. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I hand over to Holly first? We'll just keep it sorted and then maybe Alice or Emily can, can work out how it works. Yeah. So this, I hand over to Holly from industry engagement first. Right. Do I need to put the mic on? Is no, that will be Okay, so we've, you've heard a little bit um, from the researchers. Um, I want to start off talking about why I consider an ARC linkage, and it's a similar point that's been brought up before. Generally, the success rate is higher. Um, in addition, last year, um, $30 million was taken out of the um, discovery program and put into linkage, so there is actually additional funding in there at the moment. 
Um, an ARC linkage, because it's dealing with real world problems and engaging with industry, is often an excellent way to demonstrate impact and engagement, which is becoming increasingly important. Additionally, there's a lot of research questions that are actually better addressed uh, through industry relationships. You need that industry knowledge, the industry access to information, that sort of thing. Uh, the, other the other reason is that often to be successful with a discovery, you have to already have an ARC track record or people on your team that have an ARC track record. Linkage is more about um, the relationship with the industry that you have and demonstrating industry need. The other reason I often advise researchers to think about an ARC linkage is if you are looking at ways, if you have a small team and you're, you're at capacity and you're looking at ways to build the capacity of your team, often what comes from an ARC linkage is a research fellow, a postdoc, PhD students. It is an excellent way to start building research capacity uh, So what is a successful ARC linkage built upon? And this is an issue that the speakers today have already touched on. In my mind, um, not, all, not all research questions are going to lead to a successful ARC linkage. It's really that meeting of where you have an industry need or challenge and where that overlaps with an interesting research question. And I liked how the other speakers referred to it as a slice because even in a three, four year project, it's only going to be feasible to be able to address some of industry concerns. So it's looking what is feasible within a, a grander problem for industry that you can solve uh, within a three year period. And also what part of that becomes an interesting research question. Uh, so I guess one question, uh, particularly for researchers who are early career and thinking about uh, an ARC linkage is who is an industry partner? When we refer to industry, there's often this misconception of, of business, but it encompasses a whole range um, beyond business to government agencies, often state or federal governments um, are partners on, on ARC linkages. It involves the community and not-for-profit sector as well. So there is a huge list of um, industry partners that you can consider. And like was mentioned earlier this morning, often it's a grouping of these partners that are needed to bring together to, to sort of address a single issue within an ARC linkage. So how do you start thinking about who your partners might be? I think a great position is to think about what is the question that you're trying to address and then what industry partners might be interested in this. The other question to think about is who's going to benefit from this? So what are the outcomes of my research and who is, going to, who is that going to affect and who are going to be the beneficiaries of my research? So it's thinking about who's going to be interested in caring about your research and the research outcomes. But there's also a fundamental question of, of dollars as well, because you do have to consider is where the cash is likely to come from. In an ARC linkage, it's common to see some industry partners that are brought on board, not necessarily with cash potential, but because they are part, of, they needed to solve the problem. But it's crucial that you do find one or two industry partners that do have the cash to want to solve this problem. So how to begin building industry partnerships. Um, I've worked helping researchers build ARC linkages for well over 10 years. The biggest mistake I've heard is I'll go and speak to a researcher and they'll say, I've got a great project. Um, I just need to find an industry partner for it. And I have to sort of say, well, we need to step back, take a step back. You might have a great project. You might think it's a great project, but you don't know if your industry partner thinks it's a great project. So it's always best, you might have a broad research area, research agenda, but never go into developing industry relationships with a specific project in mind. Um, in the same point, um, speakers today have talk, spoken about how long it can take to develop a relationship. So it's never a good idea to, even in initial 
you know, not just the first meeting, but the first few meetings to talk about cash. It's really about going in to listen. Um, and I, I liked the idea that um, several of the speakers referred to of having, um, going to targeted conferences, conferences where, that are relevant to your research area, but also where you know likely, you know, industry partners will be. And it's a matter of really just sitting down and, and listening and asking questions so that you understand what the problems are and the challenges are that they're facing. And then think about how your research perhaps fits within that. It is a two-way education as well, like um, getting industry partners to understand the value of research um, part of it is that the ARC linkage offers a fantastic leveraging opportunity for the small amount of cash that an industry partner gets puts in. They get to be part of a much bigger um, research program. So it's a matter of listening, understanding, and then confirming what you understand to be your industry partner's priorities or challenges, and then talking through the various ways in which you might be able to address those priorities and challenges. And also in doing that, um, setting clear expectations. Often you won't be able to solve all of a problem. It's about what are, what are the most important problems and how can we address that? So there is uh, somewhat of a formula, I believe, in developing um, a successful partner into an ARC linkage. What the ARC looks for when they're assessing your application is that you have engaged with this partner before, that you have a relationship, that you understand their problem. So I always recommend thinking of small steps that you can build trust and demonstrate engagement with your industry partner. Now, this might be uh, to start with a, a whole series of meetings and then from those discussions, it could be that a student is placed for a period of time with the industry partner, but mostly it's uh, a small pilot project and that's often picking what, what's the one really, you know, key thing that we're looking at and often it, it's, it's even just a very, very small slice of a slice. Um, and in undertaking that pilot project, it does two things. It helps build trust. It helps the industry partner understand the value of being in a research relationship. It gives them some immediate results. Um, but importantly as well, often it can lead to a publication. Ideally, uh, ARC does like it if you have published with um, your industry partner from that research before. So a really small pilot project uh, can be a really significant way to develop a relationship ready for an ARC linkage. And so when you're at that time when, you know, say you're publishing or you've finished your pilot project, that's when I suggest it's a good time to start talking about what the ARC linkage itself um, might look at. My experience, which you heard from other speakers today as well, is that it usually takes at least two years from that first conversation that you have with an industry partner to when you submit an ARC linkage, it's usually two or three years. So it's best to go in with this with a long term view. Um, I think often ARC linkages can be unsuccessful if that early relationship building has been rushed. And so I guess I've said, you know, don't ask for cash early on, but there comes a time where you obviously do need to have the conversation of, um, are you willing, you know, to support this research project? So ideally that can't take place until you've developed trust and a mutual understanding with your industry partner. So that's through lots of small steps, uh, lots of discussions, sometimes round tables, Sometimes it's bringing the various industry partners together as well so that they can see that they're not just part of a research partnership, they're, they're part of a broader um, collaboration. And then you need to think through, well, if these are the steps of what you, the industry partner wants achieved in the project. What money do we actually need? Do we need a PhD as well as a postdoc? Do we need a project manager? Uh, what's the, what is the field research going to look like? What are all the bits and pieces that are going to add up? And so once you've got an idea of what that project is actually going to cost, that gives you um, a realistic 
starting base of what you need from your industry partners. And this is at the point as well where it often becomes clear that it won't just be one industry partner. Sometimes it is, but often it's a, it's a collaboration. And so in making your pitch or request for cash, you need to start by first demonstrating that you understand their problem. Explaining the opportunity, you know, which is a considerable amount of leveraging of federal government funding and possibly other industry partners con contributing to an ARC linkage as well. Clearly articulate, you know, your solution, how you're going to tackle this project and where you hope to be, what, what are the clear outcomes? And then be very clear and specific um, in your request. I've often seen industry partners feeling a bit unclear about what is the next step, what's being asked from me, not just in terms of cash, but in terms of other um, things as well. Uh, so what I wanted to do quickly is just run through the selection criteria of an ARC linkage. Um, part of the reason I think it's important to do this is that these specific points um, are actually, uh, you actually have to address in section um, D of your application. And it drives home the point that really the most important thing in an ARC linkage is the relationship with the industry and industry need. So if you've ever submitted an ARC discovery, you'll notice that in the investigator capability section, it's really just on your publication track record, um, the investigator's capability. Whereas this clearly states potential to engage in collaborative research with end users. So they wanna see that you having, have a history of engaging with industry and in particular with the industry partners that might be involved on this project. Uh, in terms of the project quality and innovation, I guess in a discovery, the emphasis is more on uh, the scientific innovation. That's, that's still important within a linkage. But again, it's looking at how you're going to address industry problems. So in your application, you need to very clearly articulate what's the spe specific market opportunity. Um, how are the outcomes of this project going to address an important problem or provide an end user and industry advantage? And how will the project significantly enhance links with industry and or other organisations? And so it's important to remember that that is the whole purpose and aim of an ARC linkage. It's to build those connections between uh, universities and end users. The other really important part is the feasibility and commitment. And um, Lisa was writing, uh, talking about how uh, in some applications she's seen, these things aren't clear. And as I've reviewed applications, this is often something that's skipped over. It's increasingly important. You need to show you know, the value of money of this project, how the partner contribution is helping. Um, and you need to, clearly point out the commitment of each partner organisation to the research project. And so this means spelling out what cash have they contributed, but also what in kind, how is that helping build this project and making it um, possible? And again, um, the benefit section um, is often something that's forgotten, but it's worth 30%. It's the most important part of your AIC linkage application. So it's really important that you spell out very specifically all the benefits of the research to your partner organisation. Um, what are the outcomes going to be? What are the benefits going to be? And think about the contribution to the research in developing strategic alliances between universities and industries. So I guess my point is that the whole way through developing and writing your ARC linkage, you need to have the needs and benefits for industry clearly articulated. And so there are several parts within an application where you're writing where this is really important. Section D1, as I mentioned, you have to address all those points that we just went through. And so in this sense, writing a linkage project is quite different to writing a discovery project. Um, your budget section and your budget justification is also uh, somewhere where this is how you demonstrate that this project is significant to industry. You need to show your industry partners have put in sufficient, um, not just cash, 
but also their time and other in-kind contributions so that it's very clear uh, to the ARC that this is a project that is of high priority uh, to your industry partners. And uh, Part G, which is your partner organisation letter of support, this is extremely important. Sometimes um, at a first go, I'll just see a few lines in a letter of support. That's not going to cut it. You really need to spell out how there's a clear alignment between what this research project is doing and um, the strategic objectives of your industry partner. So if you can refer back to any sort of um, Doc, strategic documents that they have, um, this really helps make that clear. And it also has to spell out the industry um, expectations and outcomes. And so often this is things well beyond just academic publications. It's thinking through um, all the different ways that you're providing um, outcomes for industry from this project. Uh, another question that's often asked is how much money do you actually need for a successful ASC linkage? Uh, well, in the last round, for every dollar asked for or funded from the ARC, there was $1.64 of total cash and in kind. So that includes the in kind. Generally, you will see more industry uh, partner cash and in kind commitment than what the ARC funds. There needs to be a cash contribution of at least 25% of the amount being requested from the ARC, but projects that are successful generally have more around a 30% um, cash component. Um, there is, of course, an exemption for this, um, which uh, ORS will probably go through a bit more, but for not-for-profits, charities, um, museums, those sorts of things, there is no uh, cash minimum cash requirement. So the advice I always give is the amount of cash you, you, you need for a successful ARC linkage is very much dependent on the type of partner. So for instance, I've worked getting a successful ARC linkage together that was with two Aboriginal corporations. There was not a single dollar of cash in that. It was entirely in kind and they still managed to get 750,000 from ARC funding because the expectation was that those sorts of organisations um, do not have a lot of cash. However, if you're working with a large company, for example, something like BHP, the ARC are going to look at that and expect to see money because this is a large company. If they're not putting a decent amount of cash into this, the question becomes, is this research really of importance to them and value? So the importance of having the cash there is twofold. One, you need enough to be able to do your project. Two, you need to demonstrate that this is a significant project for the industry partner and the cash and in-kind contribution uh, is an important way to demonstrate that. The final thing I wanted to talk about is, I guess, the end point of developing your industry partner relationship from initial discussions in an ARC linkage is the letter of support. This is usually a nightmare. Um, so allow a lot of time for that. So often I've had researchers say to me, oh, that's fine. My industry partner said they're ready to sign a letter of support. We're all good to go. And then we're still on the last day before ARC submission, chasing it three months later. So think through who is it that actually needs to sign off on this? If you're working with a government department, usually it's a director general and companies, often it's a CEO. Just be aware who has the authority to sign up on this because that's going to, to determine how long it will take. Uh, secondly, make sure all your budgets and any commitments that need to sit within that letter are finalised. Often a letter goes to an industry partner and then the details get changed in the application and then it's very embarrassing and can actually sour a relationship very easily if you have to go back and get a director general or CEO to re-sign a letter, sometimes multiple times. Uh, so always make sure what you're sending is correct. The second thing is that um, government departments in particular, you will send them a letter of support in the correct ARC format. They like to play around with it and put their own words in and take things out and then it's not eligible. So really make sure you check what you're getting back uh, is correct as well. So it, it sounds um, silly, but honestly, getting these letters of support signed off on is something that you really need to carefully check and allow a considerable amount of time for because it's, it's the final part of the submission, but I have actually seen industry relationships 
damaged by this not sort of being done in the proper way. So I might hand over to Emily now. Will we be able to, is she able to share? Uh, I don't know if it's better to wait. Maybe just because it's immediate in a way. Yeah. Um. Oh, do the part. Did you want to ask that question or do you want, would you like me to read it and respond? I might just read it out. Yeah, so Sarah has asked, um, do the partner organisations tend to know each other? Um, and what kind of expectation is there that the partners um, would be in agreement with each other? Uh, no, they don't necessarily have to know each other, but I usually in the course of an ARC linkage, you will have um, a government set up in which they will be brought together. So my advice is that they don't have to know each other initially, but I would be getting them uh, to sit around a table as part of formulating that ARC linkage application to ensure that they uh, can work together. Um, they don't have to be of the same view. I've uh, worked on ARC linkages, for instance, one brought together um, Mitsubishi um, unions and government, and they all had very different views. Um, this was looking at the, the closure of Mitsubishi and the um, impact that was going to have. They all had very different views, but we made sure through discussions leading up to that um, ARC linkage that we could sit around a table um, and that this research project was going to be able to um, proceed with cooperation. So they don't need to know each other, but I do think it's um, far better to have sat down and had discussions to make sure you can collaborate together before an ARC is submitted. Emily, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Wonderful. We can hear you. We can see your slide. So feel free to go for it. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, do you mind if I share my slides? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I have them up. Oh, hang on, just one sec. Oh. Okay. That way I can control it. Um, so the last slide had had my um, colleague, Jane Milady, as the presenter, been a late sub in for her this morning. She's um, unfortunately uh, can't make it today. So bear with me as I got these slides first thing this morning. <laughs> so I... I have had a quick peruse through them, um, but um, I have worked on linkages um, previously um, as well. So why a linkage? I think that um, the speakers have already touched on why, why a linkage. There's a lot of words on this slide, so I'm not going to read them all, but um, I think we've, we've touched on why a linkage basically provides an opportunity for industry and, and um, end user funding to be leveraged um, uh, with government funding to allow potentially a greater depth project that may be possible in the direct consultancy, um, but therefore answering questions of the industry and, and, and users may have, um, but also helping um, researchers. So the collaboration enables researchers with different expertise um, and to facilitate an alliance and an engagement with industry and user partners through um, their research process. Um, the partner organization, of course, gets to utilize um, cutting edge research expertise 
to facilitate potentially um, a translation of a concept into a commercial opportunity, um, access to significant infrastructure um, that universities have, like laboratories, different equipment, et cetera. Um, and also an engagement with PhD students and postdoc researchers. Um, and so it contributes to the training and development of uh, potentially industry ready skills for a future workforce. So why a linkage as well? We, I think we've heard that they do have a, a higher success rate <laughs> at times. Um, just ignore the round three where we notice a significant drop in our success rate at only 13% for QT, but overall for LP20 rounds one through three, we saw about a 25% um, success rate overall for linkages. So they can be quite, um, uh, quite successful. The other thing to note is the ARC hasn't, they, they've got a limit on the pool of funding, but not for any particular round and they will fund up to whatever um, projects are deemed fundable. Um, that being said, they will not fund anything outside of that, that, that range. They will just stop at, at the level of projects that are funded. So you do need to make sure that your, your project is um, absolutely um, addressing the criteria of the scheme. So track record isn't as important as, as it is for discovery and fellowships. Um, partner or organizations and the relationship you've built with them is important. Um, different things like potentially you've got a history of joint publications um, and also a good involvement and a cash contribution from your partner organization. So involvement can be demonstrated in a number of ways. It may be the cash and in-kind contribution or it may be a, um, a partner investigator contributing significant um, expertise to the project. So this can come in different ways but you really need to have a commitment from your partner and it's really about working hand in hand um, together on achieving an outcome. Um, and also previous linkage project success is not necessary for, um, for success. So we, we all know that um, we've, we hear, hear the myth of um, if you've got a discovery, you know, the ARC likes to fund their own. Um, there've been many one-time um, winners or first time winners of, of linkage projects and so it's not necessary to, to have had a significant track record in the scheme. So important considerations include your relationship with partner organisations and to ensure that you manage expectations. Um, others can probably speak um, with more expertise on how this is achieved. However, it's important to remember this isn't a consultancy. Um, so it's not just about what the partner organisation wants to get out of this project, um, but both of you as, as, a, um, as a team, I suppose, is the best way to look at it. We do see linkage applications which read more like a consultancy, um, and we do question this, and these are, these are unlikely, significantly unlikely to, to be successful. Um, competitive applications uh, demonstrate a track record of working um, together with partner orgs as well. Um, if appropriate, it can be beneficial, as I mentioned earlier, to include a component of the project um, at the, potentially at the partner organisation um, or that potentially a partner investigator can be added to the grant that may be actively um, conducting research related to the project, either PIs from all of your, all of your partner organisations or just one specific, but it really shows that real proper interaction um, in the project. So you must align with the objectives of the scheme. And as I mentioned, applications will not be competitive if it's clearly a, consultant, a consultancy project um, just dressed up as a linkage project in order to leverage government funds. So here's some real basics about the scheme. I know a lot of this information is, is really dry, but I think it's important to think about when you're going to your partner and, and also thinking um, long-term about what you might be working towards. The duration can be two to five years. Um, must, must include at least um, one partner organisation, but we've seen linkages with many. The AARC funding minimum is 50,000 up to a maximum 300K per year. And the projects must develop new knowledge, should involve some risk or innovation. Um, and as we've mentioned multiple times now, it can't be um, contracted research or consultancy. So it's to support the development of long-term strategic research alliances between um, say QT and industry and other end users. 
um, to apply advanced knowledge to um, real world problems. Provides opportunity for internationally competitive research projects, um, and, but also to enhance the scale and focus of research in Australian government priorities. So whilst you can absolutely involve international um, collaborators, partners, or other institutions, Remember, this is, this is about benefits to Australia, which may also be applied overseas as well. We should, uh, the intended outcome is to increase Australia's research and innovation capacity to generate new knowledge, but also develop new technologies, products, ideas, and of course, um, uh, contribute to the creation of jobs and economic growth in, in, in Australia. So we've already, um, Holly already mentioned, went through the assessment criteria. So I'm not going to spend um, a, a lot of time here at all, um, other than to say each one of these aspects is absolutely crucial, even though um, benefit may be, uh, may be more. Um, we, we do find that a lot of people don't spend a lot of time on this particular section, um, and it seems to be a real afterthought. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, it's often the worst done part of, of all ARC grants. This, this applies to discoveries as well. Um, I think people maybe they, they get tired of this section after they've spent all the time crafting their part F or their rope. Um, and so then the investigator capability section nearly becomes a, you know, a, a list of, of people involved. But we should really use this section to address a number of key points. Why this team? Do you have a history? Why, why are you best placed, this particular team best placed can to, to um, deliver on this, on this project? How will you work together? Have you set up particular um, ways that will enable you to work together, especially with your distance? And we know that's, a, that's definitely a, a problem at the moment, but how, how are you going to work together? Will there be mentoring involved? So that you may have a number of early careers or PhD students involved in the pre, um, in the project. So again, one of the benefits is is to develop, I guess, an industry ready workforce. So how is this going to be? You know, potentially this is part of your project or something that you've thought about. How is in industry integrated into the team, or are they? So as I mentioned, you may have a partner investigator on your um, in in your team that you name on the application, and they may be doing some specific task associated with the research. Um, and are the time commitments realistic? So remember, this is also about capability. So do, does this all make sense? I'm not gonna go through any of this at all. You can have the slides um, after by all means, um, but well, just- Happy to tell you. Am yes. I, um, so I appreciate this. If, we, if you don't mind, we can share those slides. And many of them, of course, are, are slides um, that are then easily accessible. So if you could focus maybe on, on one or two elements that are, that are less public knowledge or- Yes, of course. No, I'm going to I'm going to skip past a lot of all of these. <laughs> I was just about to zoom past them. Of the time, it would be nice. Of course. Um, to move from presentation to conversation, unless there are any slides where you feel they 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 really. Think I just want to touch on one thing. I'm just going to zoom past a bunch of these slides. So yep. just bear with me for one second. So all of these things. Um, I'm not sure if this applies to anyone, but the medical research policy is absolutely oh, crucial. Yeah. If if this is something. Um, the PO contributions is something that potentially people get confused about. Um, and I think as was mentioned by Holly, um, there are some uh, exemptions, um, but also if your PO is funded predominantly from Commonwealth or state or territory government funding, then their cash contribution cannot account for more than 25% of the required. So just, just I guess, we can go through the eligibility with you when you have your ideas, but just keep these in mind, depending on who your partners are. Um, so they're the exempt ones. The other thing I think people wonder about is the expectation of cash. So this graph just demonstrates the um, successful linkages we've had and the percentage of, of um, partner organization, organizational cash we've had as a percentage of the total ARC request. So if you look here, it, it really is spread. So that's not to say if you that your linkage will not be successful if you don't have, you know, a ton of cash. I think the important take-home message from this is it needs to be relevant to your um, to your project, and you really need to make sure that you demonstrate um, you demonstrate that commitment from your partner world, um, and that this is a real going to be a real benefit. So 
um, yeah, this is just to demonstrate there is no absolute formula um, for partner cash. Um, so just some, some tips on CIs. Um, can make sure that everyone is in there for a reason. Have a demonstrated track record of research, but in the field, don't just add people because they're, they're really great, but they have no real reason to be there and you're just filling out your, um, your CV. So everyone should have a role in the project. That includes partner investigations. Uh, partner investigators, sorry. Um, develop a collaborative relationship with your partner organisation. Really early, consider whether undertaking a pilot project is an appropriate first step or another other collaborative research development, um, such as small consultancies or engaging as in a scheme such as Innovation Connections. So that can start to demonstrate that track record. Um, ensure your communication is clear in terms of requirements and um, not only for the application, but also once the project is funded and certainly um, our teams at the IRS can help with this. Um, there's some really basics about the application form, but I won't go into, into them at all. Um, but just make sure that your entire project is, is cohesive. And I think Lisa touched on this really well earlier. And, and I won't go into that. Um, just to know that our LP21 dates um, are coming up and these will be available in the digital workplace, so no need to remember them. Clicked on the, uh, the email but that, so you can just get in touch with us. Um, as soon as you get in touch to us, we will help with any application development support that you need and help you write into sub, um, submission. And here's some interesting resources that you can have. Um, and just also quickly, our linkage projects incentive scheme, you can provide it up to $1,000 um, from the URB to, assess with, to assist with the preparation of a QT led. Um, LP21 application. So you can submit these applications at any time. And that's it. That's all I've got. Thanks so much, Emily, for, for stepping in a very short time and delivering a, a great presentation here. So we have a few minutes left. So it would be nice if Polly and Emily maybe could join us for a bit of a, of a Q&A here. Um, uh, again, I ask anyone who's still with us um, to, to ask any sort of questions in my place. So I think it was good to get a bit of a, of a, a feeling for also the, the funding that is required. So while we can Google the mechanics, it's often sort of the uncertainty that are, of how much cash is required and so on um, that, is, that is needed. I can't see any more questions from anyone here. Uh, so I think it's important with the linkage that we put three rounds. It's more of a continuous scheme that once a year. Um, and I, I think we maybe, maybe line up all the ducks and I'd like to highlight, you don't have to do everything on your own. So, so as Saga Hala, we are happy to find within three partners, the U office, Emily's office, are uh, helpful left, right and center. So it, it's one of those schemes where can, there's a lot of scaffolding uh, available. Um, and, and if you combine ARC and industry funding, an opportunity to really, really scale up your research quite quickly, quite dramatically. And for many individuals, an ARC linkage is the first step towards a successful ARC. Uh, research um, track record. Um, so, um, if there's no other. Uh, my question is asked how do you distinguish between a consultancy and a. Yep, so I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Emily and Holly, if you want to respond to this. So, the question was the difference between uh, consulting and linkage. A difference between what? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear. A consulting activity. Consulting activity so and a linkage. Then there's a consulting opportunity has potential for linkage. And sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you want me to answer? Yeah. So, a consult a linkage really is a research project. It's a it, it's a collaboration between um, you and the partner org. A, a consultancy is more. You're just addressing a partner org comes with you and says we want you to do this very specific research task and we are going to fund it. And we go into a consultancy, um, a, a contract with them specifically to produce X output. Um, usually um, that would mean that they would keep IP and, and things like that, although that, those things can be negotiated. Um, 
whereas a linkage really is a research collaboration. So you're solving a real world problem, but it's something you're working on, you're bringing particular expertise to, um, and, and it is much more of a partnership. Does that make sense? So, but certainly a, a linkage could come from a consultancy and, and vice versa. Was a jury, with a consulting project, you solve a problem. With a linkage, you solve a class of a problem. So we still say that's the research question. It's just that the industry partner is sort of the main source of empirical evidence. It's not like sort of case study kind of work, actually design research. But it's important that, uh, as I highlight, it's not just an individual problem. It needs to be pointing to a class of a problem. So if I take uh, urban utilities, um, the um, um, balanced business case. I mean, utilities needs to kind of submit a business case that includes monetary, non monetary figures, and they have to do this immediately. But of course, we generalize it towards sort of balanced scorecard like balanced use case, a balanced uh, business case. So it's a sort of what I call it science and fire, yeah, just to see the, the bigger intellectual challenge and an often very pragmatic industry problem. All right, if nobody has any more questions, again, I'd like to thank, to thank in particular now um, Emily and Holly for, for your work. And um, hoping we can share your slides. Absolutely. Wonderful. Good. Thank you so much. I will circulate the slides to you and everybody else, of course. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning, for, for your input, your questions, your attention. And again, Lisa, uh, thank you so much for your earlier contribution. It's wonderful um, also that you uh, do this massive community service um, being on the, in the culture of experts, which is a tremendous, tremendous um, time that goes into it. Um, and, and the system only works because of people like you doing a fantastic job. My pleasure to be here, Michael. Thank you very much and good luck, everyone. Um, happy to assist in any way I can, Michael. If there's anything else you'd like me to add to, all right? So thank you so much. I appreciate this. I'd also like to highlight from us on our center, anyone who's any interest in a linkage, we're happy to work with you. We're happy to see you on a regular base. We're happy to read your application three, four, five times if you want. Um, so um, the, the lack of support won't be a reason uh, why, you, why you should not consider not going for an equity linkage. So with this, uh, again, um, this was just a Monday morning. Imagine what the week can do for the rest. So have a wonderful week. Love to have you all here. And I'll be see you very soon. Uh, and thanks again to Anissa and everyone for helping us to organize it. Bye-bye.